Dr. Thomas Hale now joins us from the University of Oxford. Now, he's an associate professor at the Blavatnik School of Government there. And, Doctor, what's so fascinating about your research is that at the moment it, it focuses really in on what's happening within COVID-19. You look a lot about political institutions, their effectiveness or lack thereof of, of working with global challenges. And my goodness, has COVID-19 been the global challenge of all? Talk to us about the COVID tracker that you have. And at this moment, while we're looking at here in the US, booster shots for those that are vulnerable. In the UK, booster shots already being unrolled. Same in certain parts of Europe. Do you feel, is this what most developed nations, the path that they're taking at the moment? Thanks for having me, Caroline. It's great to talk about this. So uh, obviously the COVID crisis has provoked a huge range of government responses, some very different from what we had experienced in 2019. We've seen school closures, we've seen workplace closures, stay-at-home orders, all sorts of lockdown type measures that have really changed the way people live, the way we work, the way we go to school, et cetera. Now what we're seeing though, is thanks to the hard work of science, a really new layer of protection. The, the vaccines are giving us an opportunity to move past this crisis in a new and unprecedented way. That's a huge success. But where we're really falling down, as you say, is on getting those vaccines into the arms of everyone in the world. And until we do that, we're gonna to continue to struggle to get ourselves past this crisis. And if we look forward to the ongoing crises, we're sure to see in the future health and otherwise, I think we really need to double down on making sure that we're able to solve this one effectively first. And the best, most important, urgent thing to do is to get everyone in the world vaccinated. Dr. Hale, where is the most lacking right now? Immediately, I make assumptions that it's the developed world, particularly parts of the world such as Africa. Is that right? Am I making gross generalizations there? It's absolutely right. So if you look at the number of vaccines that have been delivered, it's actually quite extraordinary. Billions and billions of doses have gone into arms of people all over, all over the world. However, it really breaks down pretty catastrophically by income level. So three quarters of the vaccines that have been given globally are in the rich and sort of just less than rich countries, the upper middle income countries and high income countries. That's three quarters. The next quarter has been given to the lower middle income countries. So the ones that are just below the sort of global average countries like India. But if you look at the low-income countries where billions and billions of people live, you actually see something like a tiny fraction of percent of the doses have been administered there. Countries in Africa, countries in different parts of Asia, countries in Latin America are really struggling to get access to these life-saving medicines. And until we get them there, we're not going to solve this problem, even in the high-income countries. What is falling down here? When you're doing the analysis of the political institutions, not just individually, country by country, but, you know, the overarching United Nations or World Health Organizations. What is what is falling down here in terms of equity? Because I feel like there's grandiose statements being made everywhere about certain leaders giving their vaccines to the developing nations. Why are they not getting there? Absolutely. There, there are really two key problems here. One is, of course, supply. We just don't have yet enough production of vaccines to give everyone in the world um, one dose. And that's been particularly true because the richer countries have tended to buy up all the vaccines as soon as they become available, meaning the poorer countries are at the end of the line. So they have orders in, they have a global delivery system called COVAX, which is trying to get doses to the poorer countries in the world, but it hasn't reached its goals yet because it doesn't have enough vaccine production going on. Um, and the reason for that is, is, of course, because rich countries are buying them and getting themselves first in the line, but also because we haven't been able to expand production of vaccines as much as we need to. Um, the COVAX system, the international system of distributing vaccines, had a goal of getting 2 billion doses um, to the world this year. It's probably going to be something like um, a few hundred million that mm. we end up that's where we are now. And so I hope we get beyond a billion this year, but we're on sort of more in the 240, 230 million mm. range at the moment. So that's a really stark challenge. That is a massive miss. Is it because now we're still hoarding in the developed world and we're now giving boosters. What do you, moving aside from all the politicization of it, but just from, an, from a healthcare perspective here, from an efficiency perspective, we're just trying to get rid of this illness across the world. Should we be having boosters? So the World Health Organization has said that we should hold off on providing booster shots until we get more vaccines into the low-income countries. And I think there's certainly a strong argument for that. But I think it's also important to distinguish 
vaccine, uh, third doses for many of the vaccines from sort of ongoing boosters. So if you if there's two sort of needs we have here. One is to provide additional doses to people who are, say, particularly vulnerable because they're very elderly or because they're immunocompromised or for some reason their immune system isn't building up re resilience to COVID-19 the same way as a normal person's would. So they might need a third, even a fourth shot um, of some of the standard vaccines in order to get up to the, the sort of safe level. That's different though from providing a booster, which like, like what you would have for your tetanus vaccine or other vaccines that we get to keep that kind of um, immunity developing over time. So the World Health Organization has said that for the vulnerable people, definitely give them the additional vaccines, but let's hold off on the, on the maintenance of the booster shots until we have a bit more um, coverage globally. Now, of course, it's not only a supply question. Supply is the biggest problem, but the second biggest problem, which is also pretty good, is of course capacity. It's hard to get vaccines into every single corner of the world. And some countries have struggled to do that with our you know, pre-COVID vaccines, things that are like um, mumps and um, all the ones we, also, we, always, uh, we always give to children. So it's not like we can just snap our fingers and make it happen magically, but um, we need to work really hard that the implication of that is not sort of give up and say, oh, it's impossible to vaccinate, it's hard to reach places, it's instead a greater challenge. We actually have to go and build up the infrastructure to deliver yeah. those and I've actually do it in real time. Is that the learning here? Is it the infrastructure? If we were to look back, you're now going to be you know, writing papers, educating the future generations on how to more effic efficiently tackle such scenarios as, as, of course, a virus that goes global. Are we building the infrastructure? Are we learning from this? Do you feel that there's a more positive outcome in the future? I really hope there will be. Um, I think what we've learned so far is that you know, to be very blunt and frank, our existing systems are not strong enough. We haven't risen to this challenge of a global pandemic as we should have. We had all the reports in advance saying yes, this would happen. We knew it was coming. Governments had plans on shelves. But when the vaccine actually arrived, sorry, when the pandemic actually arrived, we weren't able to respond very effectively, both either at the global scale or in many countries at the national scale, subnational scales. And so we have our homework to do to build back better, as the saying goes, and to really make sure we're more prepared going forward. For the vaccine issue, a lot of that will require shifting how we think about vaccines, moving from, if you will, a sort of charity model where the rich countries to get themselves separate, um, taken care of first and then pass on what might be left to the other parts of the world to actually a resilient system where every country has the ability to vaccinate its population in a way that's going to keep us all safe. And that's not a charity issue, it's a self-interest issue, right? Because unless we can stop this, vaccine, this pandemic from spreading globally, we're going to see new variants, we're going to see new kinds of ways of infection are going to make us all much uh, um, much less safe. So it's really a nice self-interest that we need to put at the heart of this recovery. Sad that we have to depend on talking to people's self-interest to really motivate the change here, but clearly a change is needed in terms of the equitable distribution of these vaccines. We want to thank you so much, of course, Associate Professor over the Brevatnik School of Government. It is Dr. Thomas Hale of the University of Oxford. Thank you. Thank you for your time.